and then relax as we listen to God speaking to us. Father, we, we have come to you. Uh, the reason for which we came to this meeting is this hour, the hour of hearing you speaking to us. So we pray that uh, you will have liberty. Uh, you speak freely, freely with us. And help us also to relax as we listen to your word. Since you are using a human instrument, we pray that the instrument itself will not interfere with your speaking. You will be totally and completely in charge and speak as you please. Override the instrument. Uh, shadow the instrument. Cover the instrument. Let your people hear you speak directly to each one of those who are here, Lord. You have a way of speaking to us directly and individually. Please do so. We thank you and we bless you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We are so thankful that we are children. Thank you that we are born again. Thank you that uh, we are Christians. We want to thank you. We will listen to you if you want to change anything uh, from what we have prepared, thinking we were hearing you. Please have the liberty to change anything that you want to change in the name of Christ. Amen. Let me explain the theme and tell you how I'm sensing God wants us to proceed. The theme is polished arrows. Polished arrows. Um, concealed or hidden in his quiver. And the theme comes from Isaiah 49. Let's read it from Isaiah 49, verse 2, but we'll read 1 and 2. That's the theme for our conference. It says in NIV, he says, listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my birth, he has made mention of my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow. That, that's where our text come from. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. So that's where the theme comes from. When you look at that uh, theme, words that are important is the word arrow. Uh, the word polished is important too. It's an arrow that has been polished and this arrow is concealed, it's hidden. And this arrow is hidden in his quiver. Now, in the Bible, the Bible likes to speak through pictures. And we call these pictures by many names. We call them metaphors. We call them uh, pictures. We call them symbols. We call them illustrations. 
So throughout the Bible, God uses these pictures, these metaphors. For an example, he says in Matthew 5, 13 and 14, you are the salt of the earth. And I use the salt, but he is referring to us. He says, his disciples are the salt of the earth. And he says, you are the light of the world. Then he says, you are like a city that is built on top of a hill, on top of a mountain, because it is elevated, its light cannot be hidden. Uh, it lights the whole village, the whole place. And all these are pictures. Uh, these are pictures. Someone else says, you are like stars that are shining in a dark and wicked world. All these are metaphors. Now, if you don't understand the meaning of the picture that is used, you won't understand what God is saying. Let's assume you have never seen salt. You don't know what salt is. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. You don't know what salt looks like. You don't know what salt is used for. You don't know what salt does. Then when he says you are the salt, you don't know what God is saying you are. So for you to understand what God is saying about you using a, a picture, using a metaphor, you have to understand the metaphor itself. If you don't understand the metaphor, you won't understand what God is saying. Now, some of these metaphors are ancient, ancient, and some of them are used in a rural environment. And therefore, they could be understood by people who have got a rural background. Now here, the metaphor that is used is that of a quiver. He says, he made me into a polished arrow. So we must understand an arrow. And this arrow is concealed in a quiver. So if you don't understand an arrow and what one does with an arrow, if you don't understand what a quiver is and what the pebbles of a quiver is, then you become lost. So tonight, we want to spend all our time explaining these metaphors that are used here and then apply them to our lives. We trust the Lord will help us uh, to do that. Before I ask Zandile to show you different kinds of quivers, let me explain to you that a quiver is a container uh, that holds arrows. It's a container that holds arrows. Because when you go to battle, you don't go to battle with one arrow. You must have a quiver full of arrows. It's like a gun. Uh, if you use a gun for fighting, then you must also have bullets, many bullets. Uh, so a quiver is a bag, is a container that holds arrows. 
it holds also what we call darts, or it also holds javelins. You put javelins in a quiver. Now, the person who holds this, the person who shoots an arrow is called an archer, A-R-C-H-E-R, -E an archer, A-R-C-H-E-R, -E an archer. So the archer uh, carries a quiver which is full of arrows. And he must have also a bow because you can't shoot an arrow without a bow. We'll show you those things. Um, now there are different kinds of, of quivers, uh, different kinds of quivers. And they are usually made out of leather and some are made out of wood. And uh, there are other natural materials that are used to house arrows, uh, this quiver. Now, I want you to see five different kinds of quivers. There's what we call a belt quiver, belt. There's another one that is called a back quiver, back. There's another one that is called a ground quiver, a ground quiver. And then the fourth one is called a bow, B-O-W, quiver. The last one, I'm just throwing it in, is a Japanese quiver. But we're interested in the four. Now, I ask Zandile to share with you pictures of these quivers so that you've got an idea of what I'm talking about. Can you display them, please, Zandile? And talk to us. That is a belt. Do you see that's a belt? quiver because it is attached to this man's belt and the arrows are appearing to his right so he can reach to the arrow and throw it. That's a belt, that's a belt quiver. Another one, that one is called a ground quiver. It's when you, you are going to fight and the enemy is on the other side and you put this quiver on the ground. You are facing, uh, two armies are facing each other. You put it on the ground and all your arrows are in it. And uh, you take them from this one. You can see it is too heavy for you to be carrying around. You can carry it and put it in one spot and shoot. That's a ground quiver. Another one. Oh, there's another one. There's a back quiver. It does not show as I wish it showed us. You, you see these straps here. Uh, the straps here, you use them for carrying the quiver. Uh, the straps are in front of you, and the quiver is at the back. It's called a back quiver because it is at the back of you, but it must be one in such a way that you can reach to your back and take arrows. Uh, it's comfortable to carry it. When you put it at the back and you're fighting in the front, you will have the breastplate, you know, that covers your chest. And then at the back of this quiver, it is full of arrows. Another one, uh, there is this one called the bow uh, quiver. Um, I don't have wisdom to explain why it is called bow quiver. Uh, whether it is 
the, the quiver itself is shaped like a bow, I'm not sure, but it is called a bow quiver. And those are Japanese uh, quiver, that one is a Japanese quiver. So I wanted you then to know uh, what the Bible is talking about. Now, the second thing that we want you to see before we, we explain these things, we want now to show you a bow and arrow. Because the quiver houses uh, the arrows. And now this is a bow. Uh, when you shoot, you shoot from here. Uh, you put your arrow on this line here. And then you pull this thing. You pull it towards you. You pull this towards you. And then you release it. Let me repeat. This is a bow. It has this string here. And the arrow itself at the back is built in such a way that it can sit on uh, this string here. It can sit on this string. And then you pull the string. Yeah, you can see, yes. That's the arrow, it is that back there, which, which sits, sits on that string. It sits on the string and then you pull it and then you release it. Okay, that, that's right, sis. that's right. You pull it and you release it. Uh, these are the backs of the arrow, not the front. I'm not sure, Zandi, whether we can see the arrow head, because the arrow has a head, yes. Do we have another one? The arrow head, they put feathers here. Feathers help it to fly. Uh, they usually use feathers of a turkey or something else, but at, hidden between these feathers will be a head. And these heads are made of stone. They are made of iron. They are made of uh, bones. They are made of sharp stones. So there is, there is this rod here and you put at the head, you put the arrow head. It is that head that pierces a person and kills him. Uh, all kinds of heads, if we had time, we would have shown you different kinds of heads uh, of arrows. Some uh, will poison, they will put poison at the head of the arrow. They will poison, they put poison in it. And when they release it, and it reaches its target, uh, an animal or human being, then it poisons uh, the person it penetrates and it kills that person. Thank you, Zandi. Is there anything else, Zandi? I think we've seen everything, isn't it? Yes, Prof. Yes, maybe tomorrow uh, we will look at different arrowheads. Now, this verse says, he made me. Uh, he made me into a polished arrow. And then he concealed me in his quiver. He's talking about us. Now, let's look at then the significance of this and what uh, this is all about. Um, let's talk first about the preparation of an arrow. 
I can't give you a detailed explanation of how an arrow is prepared, but let me mention a few things about it. And if you're going to have an arrow, you must look for a stick. Look for a stick. You, you notice in the arrows that Zandile showed us, there was a stick. You look for a stick. Um, they call the stick the shaft. They call it the shaft of the arrow. The shaft, that stick. Now, what is important is that you, you get a green uh, stick, a green branch of a tree. What, what does that mean? What that means is that you don't use an old dry uh, branch to make an arrow. Because an old branch becomes brittle. It becomes brittle. You can't treat it, you can't shoot it. So you need a young branch of a tree, a green branch of a tree. Now this becomes relevant to us now as young people that throughout the Bible, God recruited young people because they were still pliable, they were still bendable, they were still treatable, treatable. Because we must treat uh, this stick. He says, a polished stick. You must treat the stick. So it has to be a young branch of a tree. You can't use an old branch of a tree. And what is amazing is that you don't use the tree itself, but you use the branches of a tree. John uh, chapter 15, Christ says, I am the vine and you are the branches. So he uses a stick that has been harvested from Christ, the vine. Christ is the trunk and we are the branches and then God is able to harvest us from Christ the vine. And we are the branches, we have to be, um, we have got to be young. Now, once you find that stick, then you must also find the head, the head. The head is the thing that will actually do the damage. It is the sharp part. That head is sharp, is pointed. It has to be flat. Uh, it must be flat. It must be attached to the stick. Remember, attached to the stick. It has to be made of a sharp stone, or you could use a bone, the bone of a horse, the bone of an animal, and you must sharpen the bone. You can use iron, can put iron. Spears that we see in South Africa, they put iron as heads. So it, it, it must always be sharpened, must be very, very sharp. And at the point that, uh, at the very head of it, must be the sharpest, so that it can penetrate its 
uh, pray. Uh, you must find that bone and attach it. What is interesting is that that bone is called the head. Is the head of the arrow. The arrow which is headless, which only has the stick and it has no head. It cannot accomplish much. Now the Bible teaches us everywhere that our head is Christ. Uh, you must have Christ as the head. I will have to have two applications here. Please follow what I'm saying. We will talk about the spiritual head and the Bible speaks of Christ as the head in many, many scriptures. Um, in um, Ephesians chapter four, it speaks of that. And in many other scriptures, Christ as the head. Head of the church itself, by the head of the individual Christian. If you don't have Christ as the head, uh, you will not accomplish much, actually, because he's the one who will be able to penetrate. He will penetrate uh, whatever uh, you are to confront. You don't confront anything with your own energy and with your own strength, but you, 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 you confront everything with Christ at Colossians 1 verse 18. Uh, let's read Colossians 1 and verse 18. And it says in Colossians 1, he is before all things and in all things in him all things hold together. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the head of the body, the church. Now, if you are a young person and you are going to be penetrating, you are going to be fighting the battles of the Lord, you need Christ as your head, then you will achieve great and mighty things through, through Christ, who is the head. Christ, who is the head. Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and verse 22, and he put all things in subjection under his feet, and he gave him, Christ, as head over all things to the church. That's Ephesians 1 and verse 22. Ephesians 1 verse 22. Ephesians 4 verse 12. For the equipping of the saints, the working of the service, the building of the body of Christ. No, I want the one that says, oh, sorry. Ephesians 5.23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, and he himself being the Savior. And there are many other scriptures that speak, that speak of Christ as the head. But there is a second sense, though, in which this head issue is important. The Lord has given, given you a head, a physical head, a physical head. And in that head, God put a brain. There's a reason why he gave you your brains. And your brains need to be sharpened. Your brains must be sharpened in order for you to be effective. And what sharpens your, 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 your brain, which is in your head, 
is education. Education. So if you're a young person and you're going to be the arrow of the Lord and the Lord is going to accomplish a lot of things through you, you need two things. You need education, a sharpened head. Sometimes when someone is not very intelligent, we say he has got a dumb head, a dumb head, tender head, a head that is not sharp. So it is important for you to further your education as much as you can. It's very critical for you to be highly, highly educated, for you to be skilled, to be skilled. Take Moses. Moses was a young person. He was an arrow in God's hand. And God wants to free the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage. But now he needs an arrow to shoot it to Egypt. So he sends David. I mean, he sends Moses. And the Bible says Moses was educated. Uh, in Acts, it tells us that Moses was educated. Is this Acts 7, 7, I think, 22. Let's check that. I think it is Acts 7, 22, if I'm right. But we'll find it in Acts. He was educated. He was a sharp head an educated head. I think it is Acts 7.22. I hope I'm right. Yes, it is 7.22. Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And at this time, the best universities were in Egypt. That's where the best universities were, were in Egypt. And the best schools were in Egypt. Best schools in Egypt was good in medicine, good in sciences, highly, very, very, very good. So he was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now see the outcome in that actually too. And, and he was powerful. Do you see the association between being educated and being powerful? There's, there's a correlation between the two. The man was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Consequently, he was powerful in speech. He was also powerful in actions as a result of a sharp head a head that has been sharpened. You'll read that in the Amplifier. So Moses was educated in all the wisdom and culture of the Egyptians. And he was mighty or powerful in speech and powerful in deeds. Young people, education is important. Don't think of education only as something that will help you to earn a salary. When we send you to school, sometimes we emphasize the importance of being a professional so that you'll be employed and earn money, which is not wrong. But we never also Associate your education with the fighting of the battles of the Lord. That when you are educated, God will promote you and put you in high positions, which you can use those positions for the benefit of the kingdom of God. There is a man called Josh McDowell. 
M-C-D-O-W-E-L-L. -E -L. His what is called an apologist. An apologist is a person who argues with unbelievers, uh, who gives argument uh, that defend the faith. Many other people who are intelligent and who argue with Buddhists, argue with Hindus, with Hindu philosophers, with uh, Buddhist philosophers, with uh, uh, Muslim philosophers. That's a sharp head. That's a sharp head. So when you are getting education, you must also be thinking of how your education will benefit the advancement of the kingdom of God. How, because of your education, you can then have an, an opportunity through your education to advance the kingdom of God head. So the arrow has the body called the shaft, which must be young. I didn't tell you why it must be young. A, a tree that is not dry, you can try it. You can take a stick that is not dry and, th and throw it. And then take a, a dry piece of wood and throw it. Try it, experiment on it. The, the, the soft green stick will travel very far. When you throw it, it will go very far. But when you throw a, a wood that is dry, it does not go too far. So God wants young people that he can shoot very far, shoot very far. Do you know when you are young, honestly, this is the truth, the sky is the limit. We can shoot you to Russia, we can shoot you to the UK, we can shoot you to Japan, we can shoot you to China. If I apply to China now and I give them my qualifications, my academic qualifications, and I hide my age, they may be interested in me. And then once they begin to ask for my age and I tell them my age, they will retreat. They will send me an excuse. Uh, people that you shoot very far are young people. Young people. The shaft must be soft, must be young so that it can travel very, very, very far. It must have a sharp, a sharp end, a sharp head. And we say that head is Christ, and that head is also your own intelligence. But now you also need glue. You need glue the purpose of the glue is that the head must be securely, securely fixed to the shaft of the arrow. Because if the head is not securely uh, connected to the to the body of the arrow. When you shoot it and it flies, the head will fall off. Young people, please be sure that Christ in you is not loose. Let me repeat that. 
Make sure that Christ in you is not loose. He does not fall off. I am really proud. You will excuse me for always referring to this people, but I am proud uh, of uh, uh, people like uh, Mr. Gaia, uh, the wife Lola Makaia, uh, voice from Lungwana, uh, and others, those of that age, because when I meet with them, sometimes they tell me stories. I hear stories, uh, Mr. Maduneni and his wife. I hear stories that these people knew each other while they were young. They know each other. They know each other before they got married. They tell me stories about Lulu, which I will not tell her. Lula, Kaia, they tell me stories about her. Stories about Kaia. They knew these guys when they were young. But the point I'm raising is that while they were young, they received Christ as they had. And Christ was glued to them, the shaft. But he was securely fixed. He did not fall off. Maybe they can tell me of other young people of their age who also received Christ when they were young. But Christ was disconnected because he was not properly glued. He was not securely glued. Now the question I want to ask you, how strong is Christ in you? I meet parents and parents tell me uh, it's a very common story with parents. It's a common thing. They tell me, they say, this child of mine, oh, he, he, he used to be born again. He loved the Lord. With some, they will say, actually, we came to Christ through him. I met parents who say that. They will say that our, our son was the first to come to Christ. Sorry. Our son was the first to be born again. But the son now is no longer a Christian. They say he was a pride because we all came to, to Christ through him. What was the problem? They had the sharp part of the arrow was loosely connected. Young person, how strongly connected is Christ to you? I'm asking, will Christ fall off? And when we shoot you, we shoot you, you are a headless arrow. Christ has fallen off. Do you know that when Christ falls off from your head, even your intelligence, your, 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 your head becomes, you've got a loosely screwed on head. You do foolish things. You do foolish things. And when we ask, well, how did you do this stupid thing? How did you do it? You can't explain it because your head was loose even your natural head, you can't think properly. You can't think properly. If we're sitting down in a meeting and we had a cycle and you had a cycle around me, you would, you would if we're interacting, you tell me of young people who, who are doing foolish things, very foolish things things that you can't explain. 
and you know that the head is not properly glued on, is not properly fixed, it bothers us as adults when young people are loosely connected with Christ because they are loosely connected to Christ, they, they can lose him. It's common to find a young person today who's on fire and the next thing the young person is no longer on fire. Uh, actually he runs away from you. Uh, he is shy, she or he's shy to talk to you. It's a young person whose, whose Christ was not settled in that young person. The head was loose. And then the third thing that is done is to put feathers. You saw in that arrow, they put feathers. Uh, the feather, the feathers uh, give accuracy as it flies. It gives accuracy by stabilizing it as it flies. Put feathers. To put feathers so that it is stable as it flies and it flies accurately. It gives, it gives the arrow swiftness just like the bird flies because it, got, it has got wings, feathers. So these feathers uh, gives mileage to the arrow. Uh, it helps it to fly very well, very well. Now, please understand what I'm saying. This, these feathers could be likened to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will, will, the Holy Spirit will give you flight. And the Holy Spirit, the Bible says the Holy Spirit guides us. So the arrow must be guided. So the Spirit of God will guide us, will guide us. He will guide us. He will stabilize our lives. Sometimes the mistake we make, particularly those churches that are not Pentecostal, Pentecostal, like my church, the Baptist church, uh, some churches that are not Pentecostal they de-emphasize the role of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. They de-emphasize, we don't emphasize it sufficiently. Even in our meetings, sometimes we make a mistake. We will invite people to come and receive Christ as their Lord and Savior we will invite them to come and confess their sins, but we re rarely, in a very rare manner, do we invite them to come and be baptized with the Spirit of God, to come and receive spirit baptism so that they are full of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says on the day of Pentecost, they were gathered together and then let's read it in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. It says in Acts chapter 2 verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled together in one place, when suddenly there came a sound from heaven like the rushing of a violent tempest blast. And it filled the whole house in which they were sitting. 
and there appeared to them tongues resembling fire, which were separated and distributed and which settled on each one. Settled on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, before Christ departed, before Christ went to heaven, he said in verse 4, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about, Christ spoke about the gift of the Holy Spirit. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He says this in, in, in Acts 1. He says, in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And the few days he was talking about was 40 days. It happened 40 days. The Holy Spirit came 40 days after the resurrection of Christ. Uh, so they were baptized then with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in a few days. And in verse 8, Christ says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Acts 1 verse 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we don't emphasize the importance of the Holy Spirit who gives you flight, who gives you accuracy, who gives you direction. So the arrow had feathers. Now, there are other things I don't want to go and talk about many, many other things in the preparation of the arrow. But what is important, you also polished this arrow. What you polished is the stick part of it, what you call the shaft. I understand that sometimes you put, you put salt on it. You put salt. We call it the treatment of the arrow. Uh, you are treating the body of the arrow. Uh, you put salt on it. Or you put, uh, you put oil on it. When you do that, you are making it to be, you are made, making it to be pliable, bendable. The more you treat it, the further it will fly. The further it will fly, it will go a distance when it has been, when it has been treated when it has been worked upon, it's very, very important. Your young person, you need, you need treatment. You need to be worked upon. So that's why you are having all these platforms. You may not understand why you are running all these platforms. It's a treatment is the equipping of the arrow so that the arrow will travel very far. A platform where you talk about success, platform where you talk about marriage, a platform where we talk about those who are older being equipped. So it's a treatment. 
We are going to be talking about that quiver, the quiver of discipleship and the quiver of your altar. We'll talk about it tomorrow. It's important that young people are trained. It's really. And you yourself must avail yourself to training. And you who are parents, you must encourage your children. Uh, no, they are not children, they are young people. Young people. Encourage the young people to avail themselves to these platforms where they are, they are treated, where they are worked upon. Now let's notice a few things then about uh, the arrow and the quiver. I don't have time to be talking about the bow. I did explain what the bow is used for. Uh, we talked first of all about the importance of the arrow uh, being made, being made, uh, being sharpened, uh, being worked upon worked upon and that's very very important it's a very very important now you also Christ says follow me I will make you I'll make you and that process of making you in order that you must be short maybe a long period of time may seem tedious. Christ recruits young people. They were all young when he recruited them. Uh, Andrew and his brother Peter, called Simon, John and his brother James, the sons of Zebedee, and Philip and uh, Matthew and others. All these guys were young. To show that they were young, they were still energetic. Other, others were still fishing. Uh, others were still working in the tax office. Uh, these were young people who were in their careers and Christ recruits them. After he recruited them, he took three and a half years of very intensive training. Sometimes you can't, understand, you can't really appreciate how intensive the training was. They stayed with him for three and a half years. Can you imagine if I asked all of you young people to come and stay with me in my home? And then every day I've got lessons when we have breakfast, we have breakfast and then we pray together and then we talk about God's word. Then we go out to work together and we're talking about God's word. At night when you sleep, we review the day, we talk about God's word, and we do that every day for three and a half years. For three and a half years. That's intensive training. That's intensive training. Other training, you go to school from eight o'clock, the school is out at four. You go to school from Friday to Monday, and classes, you don't go to, there are different classes. But now you've got Christ, your, your teacher, you are living with him. You've got classes seven days a, a week. And you've got classes four weeks in a month. Classes for 365 days in a year and he travels, the teacher travels with you. Even in traveling, traveling, he continues to teach. Training is important. I have seen young people who 
have a potential. Young people who, who could have gone a long distance, who could have achieved so much, but some of them were trained academically, but they did not receive proper training spiritually. They were not properly trained spiritually. And therefore they could not be as sharp as they could be. So the issue of being made, of being made in design, I would say that you must not miss your training. You must not miss discipleship. Every young person in the Bible was discipled when they were young. Esther, discipled by Mordecai when he was a teenager, from the time he was a child. Uh, Samuel, discipled by Eli from the time he was a he was weaned by his mother, uh, very, very young, and many, many others. That's very, very important. Now let's go to the quiver now. The quiver is the place where the arrows are kept. It's the place of safe keeping safe keeping uh, for the arrow, the arrow. Because if you've got arrows, there's no quiver. They can be exposed to rain. They can be exposed to rust, to rust. Uh, they are open to being stolen. So there's a place of safe keeping. And the place of safekeeping is a quiver, is a quiver. And the Bible sometimes says parents um, act as a quiver. Let's read Psalm 127. Parents, uh, parents as a place of safekeeping. Psalm 127. I think it is verse 5. We'll begin from verse 3. Psalm 127, verse 3. Sons are a heritage from the Lord. Children are a reward from him. Verse 4, they are like arrows in the hands of a warrior. And this time here, when it says in the hands of a warrior, parents are supposed to be the warriors and their children are supposed to be arrows. It says like sun, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are sons born in one's youth. If things were going well, really, uh, all my children were supposed to be very, very devoted to Christ. Every one of us who are born again, our children were supposed to be on fire with Christ. Fire. So that when we want to shoot them, there are arrows in our hands to fight the Lord's battle. 
Then verse five says, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. If we were doing things correctly, we parents were supposed to be a place of safekeeping for the children. We we're supposed to have taken these children, sharpened them, treated them, put uh, oil and salt and so forth, then we put them in the quiver. Quiver, a place of safekeeping and parents are that place. And tomorrow we'll talk about other places that I quiver, a place of safekeeping. And also a quiver was a means of transporting the arrows. When you're going to go to a battle, you put the arrows in your quiver, whether it is a belt quiver, uh, a, a belt, or it is a back quiver. It's a means of transporting them so that uh, when you go to fight, uh, these uh, arrows are safely kept there so that when you want to shoot them, you can shoot them. That's why if the church is another place of safekeeping, uh, organizations, organizations could be a place of keeping these young people safe and transporting them to where they ought to be. A quiver, a quiver, a quiver, a quiver. The verse that we read in Isaiah 49 and verse 2, uh, the Bible says something that is very touching there because it says in that verse, he made me. So that making of an arrow is very important. He made me, he made me, he made me. So young people must submit themselves to the process, process of being made. Sometimes young people are so arrogant. They think that they can make themselves. There is no such a thing as a self-made person. Such a thing does not exist. Everyone was ever made. He was made by someone else, particularly made by God. Made by God, using a human instrument in making you. He made me into a polished arrow. I really would want you young people to submit yourself to God. When you're a young person, it is an opportunity for you to be made by God so that you can give a testimony and say, he made me, he made me into a polished arrow. What did he do? He concealed me. God will hide you so that you will not be stolen. He will hide you so that you will not be damaged. He will hide you so that you will not rust. That oil, by the way, was also helping the arrow to keep it from rusting. You will not rust. He will conceal you, conceal you. He will hide you in himself, hide you. May God hide every young person who's watching this program. They're hiding you for the day when God will shoot you out when God will be ready to shoot you to high school, shoot you to university, shoot you to different departments, shoot you even to other countries. He's hiding you now, uh, ready for shooting. He, where is he concealing you? In his quiver, in his quiver. He will keep you there. Now, another thing that uh, 
is very important for us to understand just two last points and then we'll close. An arrow, you've got a bow, you've got an arrow and the arrow has been worked upon, has been made, has been crafted by someone who knows how to make arrows. The point I want to raise, please get it, is that an arrow does not make itself. And an arrow, even more importantly, does not shoot itself. That's the point I want to raise, does not shoot itself. Just like the physical arrow, someone must put it in the string of a bow. Someone must pull the string and release the arrow. The effectiveness of the arrow, please get this thing young person, the effectiveness of the arrow is not in the arrow itself. Please get it. The effectiveness of the arrow is not in the arrow itself. The effectiveness of the arrow is in the expertise of the one who shoots it. If the arrow is shot by someone who knows nothing about shooting an arrow, an, an, an arrow it, will, it will just fall a few years from here. But if it is shot by someone who knows how to shoot an arrow, it may travel uh, yards, uh, a long distance. And also if it is shot by someone who knows how to shoot an arrow, it will always hit its target. But the arrow does not shoot itself. It doesn't. And you also, a young person, you will not shoot yourself. Allow God to shoot you. Oh. Allow God to shoot you. Allow God. He is very, very good in, first of all, preparing you for the day of battle, preparing you for hitting your target. He's going to be working on you, working on you. Some of you, God is already working on you. I can see that. I really can see that. And some of you give me testimonies that there's something that God is doing in your life. Some of you, I, I know when I first met you, and I can see the enthusiasm that you have got for God. I can see God is working on you. I can see in your contribution when you ask questions, I'm noticing something is happening. God is working on your life. There's something happening. There is. But now you're waiting for the time when God will shoot you. You are waiting for the time when God will shoot you. Don't ever shoot yourself. Please, allow God to shoot you. To shoot you. Now, where does he keep you? He keeps you in his quiver. Who decides it is time for you to be shot. It is God. It really is God. He's the one who decides this is the time now that I can shoot my arrow. The direction to which he shoots you, who decides it? It is God. Some is going to shoot you into the direction of lawyers in a profession and then you stand for him there. Others are going to be teachers. He's going to shoot you in different directions, but it is God who will shoot you. The accuracy of the arrow and the distance that the arrow travels 
actually depends on the person shooting. Can I say that again? The distance the arrow will go and the accuracy of the arrow hitting, it's that does not depend on the arrow itself. It depends on the person shooting it. Hey, young person. Ah, if you allow God to be the one shooting you, you are going to go a distance, I promise you. You will go a long distance, a long distance. I know a young person uh, who was here in South Africa who really committed his life to God and allowed God to shoot him. Do you know where he shot him to? He shot him to the United States of America. He shot him to Harvard University. He gave him a position at Harvard University. And when he was applying for a visa, uh, the university applied for a diplomatic visa. And it was in the height of the COVID-19. But because of the visa that he had, they said this one can travel, even though it is COVID-19. This one can travel. God shot him to the USA. Some are shot to Russia. Some are shot to the UK. Some are shot to Scotland. Some are sh shot to China. Some are sh shot to Japan. Some are shot inside the country to different directions in the country. Who decides where you will land? It's God. Who decides the distance of your tra trajectory? The distance of a tra trajectory is God because he's the one who shoots you. Don't shoot yourself, young person. Allow God to shoot you. Now let me show a verse in Luke 1 verse 18. Luke 1 and verse 80. It's a very important verse. Luke 1, I think it is verse 80. It talks about an arrow called John the Baptist. God took the John the Baptist and um, he polished him in the desert. Worked on him in the desert. Worked on him in the desert. Uh, then verse 80 says, and the child grew. I'm reading it in the King James Version. And the child grew and he waxed strong in the spirit. He waxed strong in the spirit. And he was in the desert, the place of uh, preparation, the place of training and shopping. He was in the desert till the day of his showing till the day when the day of his showing unto Israel. That phrase is very important, young person. That phrase, that phrase till the day of his showing to Israel. Who decided the day of his showing to Israel? It was God. God determined now this arrow can be shot now. Shot him back into into Judea and uh, he preached there and the arrow was very, very sharp. Wait until the day of your showing to Israel. In the Amplified it says, and the little boy grew and became strong in spirit. He was in the desert, in the wilderness until the day of his appearing to Israel. The commencement of his public ministry, the commencement of his public ministry, till. So remain in the quiver until God decides when it is the time for you to be shot. Young people are 
impatient. They are really impatient. They are not comfortable remaining in the quiver and wait for the one who put them in the quiver to take them out of the quiver and to shoot them into whatever direction. That verse is very important. Really, really important. Wait patiently. I saw, I know young people who had a great potential, but they were ready to, to be shot and therefore they shot themselves. Uh, they couldn't wait for God to release them out of the quiver and say, this is the day of your showing to Israel. This is the day of your showing to Israel. Until the time of his showing to Israel. That's important. And then the last point, which is obvious. I want you to listen to it because it is a very critical point. Arrows are weapons of warfare. Can I repeat that? Arrows are weapons of warfare. So when God says, you are my arrow, <clears throat> what does it mean? It means God is going to be fighting his battles through you. If God says, you are my arrow, he means that when he fights his battle, he's going to use you for fighting his battle. When God is fighting with Satan, he's going to use you as his weapons of warfare. By the way, Satan also uses young people as his arrows. It is young people who rape, young people who uh, murder, young people who uh, commit uh, this heist uh, uh, burglaries. Uh, it is young people who are very strong in Satan worship. So Satan is targeting young people as his arrows. Where is he shooting them to? The devil. He's shooting them against the kingdom of God. Against everything that God stands for. Now, when God shoots you, in what direction will you will he shoot you against the kingdom of Satan? Against the kingdom of Satan, you are his arrows. Isn't it a wonderful thing, young person? I will show you young people that were used by God as his arrows. And he won his battles. God used Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel to fight his battles in Babylon. He used Esther to fight his battles in Persia. Persia. He used Joseph to fight his battles in Egypt. Hey, is it not a wonderful thing to be a weapon in God's hand? Is, it that not, is that not wonderful? When God will be fighting his battles using you. And he says in Isaiah 49 and in verse Two, he made me, he made me into what? He made me into, uh, um, let me read it in NIV. 
not a man. He, he made me into a polished arrow. He concealed me in his quiver and is going to shoot me one day. Then verse three says, he said to me, you are my servant. You are my servant in whom I will display my splendor. That's verse three. You are my servant, you are my arrow. You are my servant, you are my arrow. I'm going to display my splendor through you. So God is preparing you to be his battle weapons. His battle weapons so that he will use you in fighting his battle. May God not lose his battles because you're, you're not available as an arrow. May God not lose his battle because your head is not securely fastened uh, to the shaft. May God not lose his battles because you are not sharp enough. Something has blunted your sharpness. May God not use his battle because you jumped out of the quiver and therefore you are exposed to the elements, exposed to the rain and the dust and the rust. May you remain in the quiver until the time when it decides to shoot you. I'm going to ask a young person now to pray for us at the end of this now. I'll ask Volvo to pray for us. Just, just to take a time and just to, just to pray for us in response to this word that God is giving to, to us as young people. Can I ask Nolovo to pray for us now? Let us pray, brethren. Father, we thank you, Spirit of the living God. We thank you, Lord, for loving us as young people. We thank you, Lord, for sitting us down and teaching us your word. To all to ingwele, siyabule la bawo izulaku. Siyabule la mo ingwele that you are saying you want us to be sharp arrows in your hand. Lord, we thank you that you are saying that you must remain in the quiver. We must remain in Christ and Him remaining in us. You are emphasizing that you must allow you to make us spirit of the living God. You are also saying that you must not run away from being discipled, from being made. To all that, Lord, you may sharpen us. All that you may not be stranded when you want to send us to go to mm. when you want mm. to fight through us, that you will not be ashamed. When you face your enemies at the gates, Father, we emphasize the importance of education. You said you want us to be educated to go to Namanda so that you can influence. Even through the education of Snigayo. Now, Father, we pray that you help us to allow you, Osiam, to train us. Even through education, it is an important training that we must go through. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we allow you to teach us, Osiam. You also uh, mentioned that you are our teacher. You are a teacher that is with us 365 days a year. To allow you to teach us, Master Lord Jesus, to allow you to guide us as young people. So that you may help us to listen to you, to obey your voice, even as you are teaching us as young people. Father, we 
Sinete uba ezi dusfun sezon as a silent and say to that Lord may meditate on them, that Lord you may pray over them to put on Amanda onge so that they become part of our lives. We thank you, Lord. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, we will play the, the closing hymn and uh, we will ask the technical team to give us an, an announcement for tomorrow as to when we're starting. Uh, just uh, tell us when we are congregating tomorrow. Maybe either before the closing hymn or after. Back to you, technical uh, team. Um, greetings, brethren. So we will be meeting again tomorrow. Um, we'll be using the same links as we use today. We'll be meeting at nine o'clock. So it will be great if you are able to connect at least 10 or five minutes before we meet. So that will be all for today. Um, and also those who may want to listen to the recording, they will find it on Facebook. We will post the link on on the chat box, just in case you missed it or you joined in late or you had network issues. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.